the pandemic garnered much attention towards processed meats, with consumers enjoying the safety and convenience it offered. This encouraged many meat processors to invest in processing units in Asia. My colleague Zahra Imtiaz talks to Christopher Omarczynski from Marel to understand how this boost to automation has fared. Hi, Chris. Welcome to our podcast. We're glad to have you here. Hi, Zara, and good day to everybody tuning into this podcast. Thank you. And uh, before we start off, can you give our listeners a bit of an introduction about yourself? Sure. Um, as you said, my name is Chris Wojcicki. I am the regional sales director for the meat industry for Morel in the Asia Oceania region. Um, and that region includes most of what people would normally look at Asia Oceania or Asia Pacific, but does not include China, which is regarded as a separate region on its own by Morel. So it's a lot, a lot of territory and a lot of, lot of countries that I participate in. And uh, I've been with Morel since uh, 2020, March of 2020 is when I started with the company. And that was unfortunately right at the very beginning of COVID. So I've had quite a journey with the country that has led me eventually from Canada to Singapore during COVID. Wow, so you literally entered at the eye of the storm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you're the best person to speak to about this. So we, we started off with talking about a trend of how uh, meat processing increased during post pandemic. Uh, what do you think about this trend? And do you think this is a long-term trend? Well, actually, actually, I think there's two trendings, two trends that are, are emerging affecting investments. And one is a short-term, obviously in a longer-term trend. Um, in my opinion, the short-term trend is really one of supply chain chain disruption. And, and that disruption is broad, it's significant, and it's increasing costs all along the product value chain in, in areas such as feed, energy, raw materials, commodities, all manner of finished goods. And, and I think that's something that everybody is acutely aware of with the news these days. And, and of course, that's going to have a comp, uh, an impact on consumer demand. And what that impact is, I think no one is really certain yet. But I think the one thing that everybody can agree on is it's not going to be a positive impact. Um, and where where are these these uh, disruptions coming from? Well, of course, you know, first it was global COVID that that uh, hit the supply chains. Then just when we thought that that we were starting to emerge from that uh, that deep dark hole of COVID, then we had the Russia Ukraine conflict. And now possibly what could be happening in China right now is they struggle to. Uh, control COVID is is maybe going to provide a more localized effect, uh, with China being the you know the manufacturing cradle of the world. And in my guess, I, I think we're still looking at two or three more years of of disruption coming from these factors. And an additional point I'd like to make, just that's very specific to Asia and Oceania. You know, Asia Oceania is is a is a very dynamic region. It's it's a region that uh, where the marketplaces are 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 definitely um, changing rapidly and and that's due to very very long-term uh, societal and demographic factors in, in Asia and and that has been affected within the last five years again by AF, the African swine fever which has complicated the the whole investment scenario in in Asia Oceania then on top of that you know that all of that uncertainty that that normally exists in Asia Oceania. Then we had COVID. Then we had the Ukraine Russia conflict. Then we've had these disruptions with with supply chains. So um, that's definitely a very challenging in, environment right now for investment in this region. And I think it's a challenging environment all over the world, but I think particularly so in in our region here. Then there's the longer term. Okay, and that's really looking into the crystal ball and looking into the future. And what I see there is a deglobalization of supply chains. You know, in, in the world, uh, we've had a, a globalization of economies that, that's been ongoing for the last 40 years. And that's really has been unprecedented in world history. And I see that breaking down to some degree with, with all of these stresses that, that I've already talked about and maybe more to come. And how much, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think anybody has the, the visibility in the crystal ball as to how that's going to affect 
uh, the world going forward and world economies. But what I, I can, I think, fairly confidently say is that, that costs will never return to pre-COVID levels, okay? But as everything settles down over the next two, two to three years, as we come to grips with what extent this deglobalization will occur, I think we will have that return in, in, in our region to these long-term societal and demographic trends that, that everybody has well-documented and, and, uh, and will continue in, in this area. It's just too dynamic for it not to continue. So uh, putting that all together and, and how does this affect investments? Well, I think right now in, in the meat business, particularly, I, I think like poultry, um, you know, we have some very large investments that, that, that can occur and very early in the, in the value chain in primary slaughterhouses in, in, uh, and we're seeing more investments in secondary processing and further processing uh, to uh, very large investments, you know, brand new facilities, greenfield facilities being built, brownfield facilities being overhauled. And, and I think these large investments are being reevaluated right now. And, and I think it's going to result in, in these investments being delayed for a little while, possibly even postponed. Okay, as all of these changes uh, that we're grappling with right now are identified and assimilated in, into existing plans. And, and I think that's a very, very good thing. And, uh, and we will see an element of caution and prudence being applied to these investments. I, uh, ultimately, they will go ahead. I have no doubt about that. As I said, there's these longer term trends that, that everybody needs to be aware of and certainly are. And we all know with, with these major investments, they, they don't happen overnight. And, and they're not manifested overnight. They, they sometimes take a year, two, sometimes three years to really fully materialize. So these investments that, that are happening in the, in the meat processing, I, I think there may be some period of delay, but I think ultimately they'll get back on track again because they are longer term investments. And in this business, you have to look to the long term, not so much the short term. That's true because um, the Asian meat magazine that we also produce, uh, put together a construction report every year. And in our 2021 report, we saw a bit of like optimism. People actually, well, at least in South Asia, thinking about moving towards more processing side. But uh, looking at 2022, you see a bit more caution coming in. Do you think that that optimism has been held back a bit as they see the multiple disruptions you speak of? Uh, yes, I, I, I do. I, I, I don't think any, any equipment supplier in, in the industry would, would like to see that situation, but it, it's, it's the pragmatic situation that's unfolding. I mean, we're, we're in touch with our customers right now. Um, we have some customers that are committed and, and are going ahead regardless, but they are grappling with, with increasing costs in, in their project. Um, we have other customers that, that were planning projects that, that are now not um, stopping the projects, but they're reevaluating the projects and the timelines because of rising costs. And we have other customers that are that are well into projects right right now that are are grappling with the the changes in in the climate and and of course the costs. So I, I expect a little bit of a softening. Okay. I also think that in 2021 there was there was a, a, a great deal of optimism. I think we all had that optimism. We all saw possibly an end to COVID. We saw an end in, in sight where maybe things would return to some semblance of, of normality, the post-COVID world. And, and I think that everybody got a bit of a shock with, with Omicron and, uh, and how quickly that spread around the world. And it, it pro prolonged things just when we thought that, that, okay, we've come to grips with Omicron. We understand it. We understand what, what the timeline is going to be and how that affects to a, a, a post-COVID world. Then of course we had the Ukraine-Russia conflict break out. Um, so I, I think it's uh, in, in these investments, I, I remain optimistic. There's no question about it. I, I think uh, all of our, our customers and people in, in this business understand it is a long-term business and, and short-term factors have to be taken into consideration, but ultimately that doesn't deviate from the long-term plans. That's great. I just want to talk about a bit more about two things you brought up about deglobalization and about how cost is never going to be the, at the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, when I talk about 
globalization do you think since um, people are looking at uh, self-sufficiency uh, sourcing regionally and things like that that actually they would also increase their investments in processing because they would have to depend less on imports so do you think that would actually help your our processing industry and when doing so how do you how do you manage the cost i mean you said that it will never be pre-pandemic levels but how do we get to a point where it is at least somewhat cost effective well i think i i don't think that that cost effective is maybe a word to be used maybe a new cost paradigm is is what everybody comes to settle to in in the future and and by deglobalization i i mean you know fracturing of global supply chains and um and as people look to become more self-sufficient um maybe onshore manufacturing more than offshoring manufacturing because of uncertainties in, in the global supply chain um then i think costs are going to rise they, they have to okay how how substantially I don't think substantially, but again, I, I go back to my comment of I don't think they'll ever return to the fully integrated globalized economy that, that we had prior to, say, 2018. Um, so from from our point of view, as, as an equipment manufacturer, it's it's going to it's going to drive more cost in, into our equipment, which, you know, has already been seen in, in price increases that we've been forced to take to the market. Um, I think ultimately, I think some of these pricing increases hopefully will get rolled back as, as things settle in the future, or they, they simply postpone price increases that maybe would have occurred further in the future. Um, but the globalized deglobalization, I, I think, is very much a factor. And, and again, I just look at, I have to say, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, uh, I am a sales director, I'm not an economist. And uh, although I, I try and read as much about it, um, I, I don't think anybody has a has a real handle on on what that's going to mean in the long term. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't think an economist would have predicted what's happening either. So, um, well, it's you know you put three, four sales directors in a room and try and get a get a, a uh, uh, some sort of consensus. It's like putting five economists in a room and trying to get a consensus. Right? <laughs> true. So. I mean, speaking about how the processing uh, companies are coping with this, we also saw new entrants, in a sense, come uh, producers coming into the field of processing. And we saw equipment companies launching several products for small operations to start them off in the process. How do you see this strategy? Do you see this as a one a, a change? Uh... I don't think it's a it's a fundamental change. Okay, I, I see happening in the marketplace. I I think, as I said earlier, the at least the, you know, what I've been seeing in the marketplace is that that customers are not ne necessarily scaling back their their planned investments. They may postpone them. Okay, they may regroup and and and. Uh, um, focus or sharpen the the investment in particular areas okay i don't see um a broad trend for customers scaling down their investment okay um any more than i've seen before in the marketplace you know you always have some customers that that are planning more tentative moves in, into a marketplace as opposed to customers that are maybe more confident about their moves in, in a marketplace but I think given the points that I've made in, in the, our previous discussion up until this point, I, I think there is some sense to uh, having some customers slow down or scale down their, their investments, maybe more so for, for very new entrants in, into the meat processing investment area. Um, and, you know, putting emphasis on smaller investments does manage the capital for these companies, new entrants more, digital, more diligently. And, and more to the current moment. From an equipment supplier point of view, you know, having um, more starting products, if, if you will, it, it's a strategy that allows equipment 
suppliers to start earlier in the customer relationship relationship understand where the customer is and where the customer would like to go in, in the future um, more intimately and um, and that's good that that's a good thing no question about it but on the other hand it's a bit of a double-edged sword sword because it may put some equipment companies outside of their zone of expertise okay and from a customer perspective they are committing to a less efficient strategy which may involve ultimately down the line more costs as as they start to scale at that point and that's maybe where i think the differences between new entrants and and people that are already in the field and and understand this industry is is the understand it's it's sort of you pay now or you pay later and and ultimately paying later means paying more okay um so again, I come back to, we see customers maybe reevaluating investments, timing of investments, but I don't see the scope of investments changing right now. Okay, okay. true. Um, because um, I think in you know, Asia, sorry, uh, in Asia where a lot of people, are, I mean, they're very mindful of the cost factor, especially when it comes to moving towards processing. Um, I think a lot of people see this as lowering entry costs. I mean, into their journey into processing, but you're saying that this is a very short term gain, that in the long term they would end up paying more. Oh, I would think so. I would think so. Um, you know, it's always it's always more efficient to to build a building that that's going to um, accommodate your your future growth as opposed to building a smaller building and then trying to build a, a building on top of it or expand existing operations. Um, uh, it's always more difficult to do the latter than, than the former. Um, but what we are seeing, okay, in, in the marketplace is, is we're seeing a real drive to reduce dependence on labor, whether it's in green fields or, or whether it's in existing facilities. And, you know, they want to reduce their dependence on labor or customers want to use their labor more efficiently. And, uh, and they want to consolidate their operations where they can to gain those economies of scale, because that's what, what the, the market expects. They, they, it expects a more efficient, cost-effective food supply chain. And, and ultimately, that's the long-term trend, okay? That, that won't be going away with, with customer expectations. And, and I think our customers are very aware of that. Um, we also see customers who increasingly they want to deal with fewer and fewer vendors uh, in, in their operations. Um, as these operations become more complex and need more flexibility to, to respond to changing market conditions. And, and, you know, fundamentally, I think that's where morale is very well placed to assist the, these types of needs. When it comes to, I mean, talking about complexity, we move on to like uh, further processing and uh, product variation and things like that. Do you see uh, investments coming into this aspect of the processing sector? Or do you see people investing more here? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I see. Uh, but I have to qualify that. I, I think that comes not as a, as a region as a whole. I think you now have to look at, at a more detailed level and at almost a country or, or a sub-region level. You know, there's the overall, there, there's definitely uh, an appetite in, in this region for uh, additional food process, processing, product variations like the ready to cook, ready to eat, ready to eat, uh, those types. And that, that's that long-term demographic, uh, demographic and societal changes that, that we've seen happening in, in this region that are long-term trends and that are not going away. Um, but there are subtle variations in different approaches depending on the company. You know, you have more established what I call food economies, uh, example, Australia or Japan. And this is being driven by a quest, quest for market share, um, where consumer buying habits are already more established. On the other side, um, you have these less established food economies, those are, that are still developing new retail channels. Um, they're becoming less dependent on traditional wet markets. And this is something that, that was definitely hastened by COVID. Um, and these investments are more characterized by companies trying to understand what customers want, while at the same time, customers themselves are discovering what they want. So it's sort of a chicken and an egg thing situation I see in some, some countries. 
And in this case, you know, flexibility in investments is a key consideration because you have market findings that spur quick changes in direction. And, you know, I, I would also like to make the point that flexibility does not have to be at the expense of scale. If, if you're planning your, your facility smart, you can, you can cover a lot of end product variations, but for deeper in the process or uh, sooner in the process, you can, you can be smart and scale your equipment uh, as much as possible. And this is where experience in food processing really helps when, when you're dealing with a vendor that has that depth of experience. Um, but overall, again, going back to some, some very clear and specific trends that we see, without question, meat processors are moving up the value chain, okay? Um, that's where they can make more money. That's where they get more value in, in what they do. But on the other side, we see retailers that are moving back into the value chain. So it's going in both directions right now. And there's no question that COVID has driven e-commerce and, and has increased or changed the way the market works, the way the retail products are, are going to the, to the shelf. Um, for example, there's a lot more demand for fixed weight prepackaged products. And COVID has really hastened the acceptance of chilled and frozen products on, on the shelf as opposed to fresh or the wet markets. And along with these trends from, from the consumers come a lot of increased concern about food hygiene, safety, um, the trust of, of these new types of packaging and, and new brands that are on the marketplace. And I think that's understood as customers change their, their buying habits and start adopting unfamiliar products and suppliers. But that also drives a need for digitalization, which is a, a new concept coming into our discussion right here. Um, and again, you know, I'll emphasize in, in that trend, we see customers that don't want to deal with a lot or, or multiple vendors. They, they want to deal with one vendor that, that can give them everything that, that they need. You have to, as you said before, invest for the future, right? So when in such a very uh, unpredictable kind of environment, how do you invest? Well, I think it's not, not an environment where, where, you, where you invest speculatively. I think it's an environment where I think the companies that, that do their homework, do their market research, un understand their markets and, and understand their consumers are, are the ones that will come out on top. So those will, the one, uh, will be the ones that armed with that knowledge and, and information will be able to plan their future investments much more wisely than, than others. So I think, you know, in my advice to companies that are, that are looking to start investing in process, how would they go about it? I would say choosing equipment and, compute and equipment suppliers that have deep competencies in these areas, automation, um, digitalization, and the food processing area in general, okay? That is gonna be very critical, okay? But it's not only equipment suppliers like, like Morel in that area, it's your other key components of, of making an investment. It's your facility design, your construction company, okay? All of these, if they have deep competencies in, in these areas, they may be more expensive in the short term, but ultimately they're gonna save you money in the long term. Thank you, that's a good point to end with. And it's been my pleasure to speak with you. I hope that you get some interesting tips to ride out the current storm in the meat industry. Stay informed and know that change always brings in new opportunities. Thank you for listening to us at Asian Agribiz Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts to keep up to date on the latest happening in the animal protein industry in Asia.